Namaskar and good evening everybody. <coughs> I welcome all of you uh, to this Sunday webinar of Philosophy Family. Well, today um, we have uh, uh, two speakers, uh, Ms. Tanushri Patel and uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Kashmira Murmu. Well, um, both were uh, uh, selected as uh, um, uh, the extra poor speakers in 2021 and 22 uh, respectively and now um, um, that uh, philosophy family has uh, uh, declared them as independent speakers now they will be given opportunities to speak uh, in this forum well Tanusri uh, Patel um, she is a PG student uh, in IIT Mumbai and uh, she will be uh, uh, delivering a talk on uh, Pramana uh, in the version of uh, Sri Harsha and uh, uh, in the first session and in the second session we have Ms. Kashmira Murmu uh, working as uh, assistant professor uh, in philosophy uh, in Ravensa University, Katak. Uh, she will be speaking on, let me check well, um, she will be speaking on, I have to check, yes I forgot what she will be speaking on. Ramos sir, what's he will be speaking on? Yes, he will be speaking on Jaina Metaphysics and Analysis. Well, uh, well um, uh, the, the coordinator is absent, so I was uh, immediately uh, into the program. So, in the first session, we have Tanushri Patil, and she will be speaking on um, uh, Pramana and Sri Harsha, and Kashmira Murbu will be speaking on uh, Jaina Metaphysics uh, uh, and an, an analytic account into that. Well, uh, let us move to. Uh, um, Tanushri Patel in the first session. Okay, so I welcome um, all the participants and I also welcome um, our admin, Professor Pramut Matas, uh, senior professors uh, in the group. Well, uh, also uh, welcome Aminas Srivastav sir um, and all the participants. Well, uh, without wasting much time, let us move to uh, Tanushri uh, in Mumbai uh, to join us for uh, her lecture. Okay, let us all move to uh, Tanushri for the lecture. Well. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. So, as my topic is declared by sir, uh, that I'll be speaking on Pramana in the context of uh, Sri Harsha. So, before uh, talking about what Sri Harsha does, I would like to give a brief uh, introduction and I would like to read out my introduction part uh, in my paper. So the work of Nagarjuna, Jairashi and Sri Harsha respectively sits near the beginning, middle and the end of the classical tradition that emerged from the skeptical roots that grew in the soil of early and ancient Indian philosophy. These three are referred to by Ethan Mills, who is inspired by Eli Franco as the three pillars of skepticism in Indian classical uh, context. Uh, the legacy of philosophical skepticism transcends the difference between heterodox Buddhist and Chabaka and uh, other Brahmanical philosophers. It dates back at least to the end of the classical era and to the early beginning of the Indian intellectual tradition. These skeptics, having used the prasanga technique for discussions and critique, where their uh, opponent, without putting forth the counter thesis, were called. Vaitandika. So what is now this Prasanga technique? So Prasanga technique is uh, something which we usually will find in the uh, philosophy of Nagarjuna. So Prasanga technique is a form of argumentation in which several possible interpretation of an uh, opponent's thesis are put forth, uh, each being rejected in turn of an opponent's other commitment. So that we are going to see in that paper, how is Sri Harsha uh, rejecting all the positions, all the possible positions that can uh, that can be made by a Nanyaika uh, interlocutor. So, Matilal, uh, 1986, called this uh, Prasanga technique as commitment-less denial. And that we are going to see very soon. So, what is Sri Harsha going to do in his uh, philosophy? So, basically, uh, Sri Harsha is going to reject the realistic positions uh, that is um, that is held by the Nanyaikas. Uh, when they say that both the object as well as the pramana has to exist. And uh, then we are going to discuss that how is Sri Harsha a Vaitandika. So what is Vaitandika? So we know that in the uh, 
in the in the uh, epistemology of nayakas there are three types of uh, debates uh, the first one is known as the vada the second one is known as the jalpa and the third one is known as vaitan uh, vitanda so in the first two uh, process or the or the type of theory we can say both the interlocutor both the both the purva paksha as well as the uttar paksha uh, both the both the debater put forth their put forth their thesis but when it comes to vitanda one of the debater does not put forth the thesis or a, does not make a counter thesis what he does is he just keeps on rejecting the uh, the, the the argument that is brought about by the opponent so shri harsha is going to do the same and then we are going to see how is shri harsha uh, is more concerned about the daily life situation and this is the reason why he denies the existence of like we cannot say he denies the existence of epistemology but uh, like over epistemology or the epistemic system that we talk about he puts for the daily life concern over this epistemology that is maintained by the nayakas who were realist so shri harsha uh, is the writer or the author of uh, the khandana khanda khadya where he has four chapters and uh, the first two chapter basically deals with the logic and the debate so there we see him mentioning about a imaginary opponent uh whom we can infer to be naya i guess because he in the opening section of that first chapter says that the imagine opponent who we are considering as a naya i guess seem to hold that both disputant must agree both disputant before entering into a debate must agree that those categories exist that are established by doctrines admitted by all the schools that we known as that we call as pramana so basically uh, nayakas maintain that before entering into a debate it is very much necessary that both the interlocutors should uh, admit the existence of pramana or what we call as the means of knowledge so from this it seems that he is referring to a nayaika opponent and uh, he is going to argue against him the nayaika so the opponent is accepting that the existence of the instrument of knowledge which we call pramana as the prerequisite for meaningful debate so uh, yeah so what shri harsha does further is he takes the uh, he brings forth four uh, possible reason why is it so necessary to accept a pramana before entering into a debate and then uh, holding this four uh possible reasons he eventually keeps on uh, just rejecting all the four type of uh, reason that is that that like uh, makes it uh, very much necessary for the acceptance of pramana so out of the four possible reason that suggests that why a uh, um, pramana is so much necessary in the process of debate out of those four the first one is that so he uh like he he makes his own uh, reason that uh, that that can be a possible argument coming from the nayakas so the first proposition is that because the non, non acceptance of the pramana would prevent one to be a part of the debate which is restricted to those who do accept that so uh, here it can be a possible reason that if you do not accept the pramana you are not allowed to enter into a debate or you are not allowed to participate in a debate so the counter that uh, shri harsha throws is that uh, debate is still possible even if you do not accept the pramana and how is it that possible so he says just accept all the characteristic of fallacious argument like what are the reason or what are the characteristic that can make your argument fallacious just decide this and you are done you don't need to accept all sort of pramanas so um, according to him let this uh, let this characteristic of fallacious argument be the matter of commonality or the matter of agreement between the two interlocutors and this is sufficient to debate so here we can see that here i reflect that shri harsha understand according to him debating is kind of a game just like wittgenstein says in his pi that uh, to play a game it is very much necessary that you must have a criteria 
you must have a criterion or a, or criteria so that you can at least uh, you can decide if the game is going well or if the game is not going according to the rule so following a rule is very much important according to shri harsha so uh, but the concern is that do not decide the criteria of the game beforehand let the let the context of the game decide what the rule should be and then i understand that by not accepting the uh, pramana instead choosing the uh, characteristic of fallacious argument he is widening the scope for the consideration of means of uh, knowledge it is it is uh, saying like let's take this example uh, for example in our household we have seen our mothers just uh, uh, doing the process of winnowing so instead of picking all the grains from the mixture of grain and chaps what we do is we take the, take the help of the process of winnowing and through that all the all the unrequired things are uh, removed and what is required is got so he is uh, he is applying the same method it seems to me so then in the khandana khanda khadya it seems that uh, the imaginary nayaika who is the opponent he argues that how is it possible that you are going to enter into a debate just by accepting the characteristic of fall fallacious argument so the reply that uh, the nayaikas get from the uh, from shri harsha is that just like charbaka and other skeptics and by other skeptics i think he means uh, the he refers to uh, nagarjuna who was also a skeptic and whose process was also uh, prasanga and can be called a vaitandika so just like charbaka and nagarjuna uh, were able to enter into a debate similarly we can also enter into a debate by not holding a position and uh, because see the uh, the thing is that beforehand or in a a priori manner no one can uh, like decide or no one can recognize if a if the interlocutor who is coming is a vaitantika or not it is only during the course of the debate we get to know that yes the uh, interlocutor is a vaitantika and that is only possible through the recognition of his method so yeah so just like chabaka can enter into a debate similarly a vaitandika or a person who is just considering the uh, fel characteristic fallacious argument can enter into a debate now the second reason that can make the possibility for the existence of pramana is that uh, that the pramana is the cause of the disputant beginning the practice of debate so this is to say that it is the pramana that makes the activity of debate possible so this is this is something which a nayaika can uh, reason for. so the counter now comes from shri harsha that if there is such a causal necessity between the pramana and the debate the problem is that the refusal of the very existence of the pramana would lead to the cessation of the debate but uh, this is not seen in the real life debate situation because if this were the case then madhyamikas which is which is uh, whose founder was uh, nagarjuna and charbaka would never have been able to get into a debate but they did and uh, but still if the nayaika who is the nayaika who is the opponent is still very stubborn and he keeps on arguing that uh, the 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 acceptance or the uh, acceptance of the existence of pramana makes up the activity of debate then to counter that uh, shri harsha says that if you are accepting the existence of pramana but it is not the case that if you exist i am going to exist it also so in this case since i do not accept this causal relation that you are creating first establish that means of knowledge do exist so now this means of knowledge the or the existence of means of knowledge has become a thesis which has to be established now the problem is debate is a process through which we either uh, establish or we either disprove anything now there will be a uh, problem of circularity so uh, shri harsha writes that since debate 
has the onus to establish or disprove a thesis, the Nayaika would need to establish the pramana, which is the thesis, through the aid of debate. That is, there will be a chakra or circularity if the opponent made attempt to establish mutual dependence. If an uh, opponent relies on the act of debating to establish the means of knowledge that would make up a debate, the task of pramana, as we know, is to determine the validity of the debate. So the question is, what determines the validity of the former debate through which the means of knowledge were determined? So this is how, like, we know that uh, for a skeptics, it, uh, the notion of circularity or the problem of regresses is like very much important. So, uh, Sri Harsha, being a skeptic, keeps on bringing this uh, problem of uh, regresses again and again to argue against his opponent. So, then the uh, imaginary opponent argues that the cause which is the pramana is the rule of the debate agreed by both the uh, participants. So, uh, yeah. So what, as we see, what the imaginary opponent is trying to do here is he is trying his best to establish the existence of pramana, which is countered, which is countered attack by Sri Harsha. So now uh, we can take the third, uh, the third reason why acceptance of pramana is necessary is that uh, that is as I read that it is the pramana. So pramana can be understood as a rule which is uh, which is a matter of agreement that that is creating a matter of agreement between both the interlocutors so countering this sri harsha says that uh, the means the, the means of pramana which you are considering as the rule which is accepted by both the interlocutor would again lead to problem because uh, what if the case uh, comes that the means which you consider to be the rule could not establish the not establish the truth or could not establish the knowledge for example like that this is to say that uh, what if the thing which you were considering as the means as the means that can bring to the bring to the knowledge establishment of knowledge did not suffice to bring forth the knowledge and uh, the conclusion that you got from that rule just because you both accepted the rule the conclusion that you got from the rule would be something else but not the truth itself so what are you going to do in that case and uh, it seems that the uh, the opponent is in danger put uh, and um, he is trying again and again to bring new reasons for the existence of the pramanas so the another uh, reason for which pramana has to be accepted is that it is something loka siddha so now the uh, opponent would say that it is uh, something which is accepted uh, by people in their everyday life or it is something which is accepted in the worldly discourse. So in counter to that, uh, Sri Harsha says that it is not possible that the means of knowledge is established before the debate takes place. So before entering a debate, so as I mentioned that uh, Sri Harsha understand uh, debating and the uh, and the uh, establishment of pramana as something contextual you cannot do that beforehand before entering into a debate before knowing what you are debating for you cannot uh, beforehand establish or uh, accept any of the uh, accept any of the pramana or any of the qualifiers uh, qualifiers which you are using in the process of debate so uh, here Ashri Hasa says it would be similar to the case mentioned above in the case two, as I mentioned of the regress uh, position that one would need the process of a debate in order to establish the means of knowledge as being based on proof. So uh, from this we can infer that Sri Harsha men, uh, maintains that the pramana are something which has to be contextual, which has to be uh, which has to be determined in the context. So the fourth and the final uh, of the original position. So here by original position, I mean one of the reason that can make a Naya Ekas accept the existence of uh, the Pramana is that uh, what is required for the debate is the cognition or the Jnana of the existence of means of knowledge, but not the existence itself. 
that is the disputant must have a notion of the means of knowledge in order to proceed but uh, they need not fully apprehend it or proven the existence of means of knowledge so what does this mean so this basically means that now the opponent is arguing that uh, it is not necessary that uh, you accept the existence of the thing itself like the existence of the pot the existence of the jar etc it is necessary that you must have a cognition or the gyana of the existence of the means of knowledge and the object so shri harsha again counters and he says uh, so he says that there can be two interpretation that we can get from what the opponent is arguing the first one is do you think that the existence of pramana should be accepted merely by uh, merely because they are perceived and the second is that or you mean that one because one perceives that they are not to be sublated so the first one the first interpretation is that just because you are able to cognize does it mean that your cognition would is the is the uh, locus on the basis of which you are saying that pramana has to exist or is it that just because what you perceive could not be sublated and this is the reason you are saying that pramana exists so what is the meaning of sublation now sublation here refers to uh, the process by which one cognition is replaced by another cognition so uh, she has to says that both the interpretation can be rejected and both cannot be accepted so the first one how is he going to uh, deny the first one is that if you are saying that just because you are able to cognize the uh, pramana or the object as real this is the reason why you say that they exist then there is a problem and the problem is that even during in the case of illusion you are able to perceive a snake in a rope but that's not the case but still you are cognizing so just like the snake rope case uh, in the snake rope case just like the existence of the snake is denied similarly in this case your cognition of the for the existence of the pramana can be denied now the second interpretation where he said that uh, because you perceive or you cognize something which cannot be sublated which cannot be denied in any case if that is the case and uh, due to which you are arguing for the existence of pramana then that is also problematic so there can be two way to make sense of this second interpretation the first one is that either the means of the knowledge are not perceived to be subjected uh, or it can be the case that uh, it genuinely cannot be sublated it is something so real that it cannot be sublated in any way so the first uh, case where it is said that either the means of the knowledge are uh, not perceived to be sublated in the course of debate so uh, this is to say that like in the setup of debate in a debate setup where there is the audience there is a judge there is an opponent and they could not see the malfunctioning of the uh, pramana through which the one of the interlocutors is debating if that is the case and uh, on, on the basis of that you are arguing that the pramana exists and it would be misleading because something can be uh, something can be real like something which is appearing to be real something which is pseudo real can be real at this moment but there will be a day or there will be a moment when there will be a cognizer who can cognize the mal functioning of pramana and uh, then comes the second uh, sense that we made of the second interpretation that something which is genuinely true genuinely real cannot be sublated in any way but still he finds a problem in this and the problem is that the existence of the eternally sublated way of knowing is redundant and utterly unrealistic because daily life function just fine uh, is just fine without such intellectual complex uh, assumption about the existence of such a means of knowledge so here um, shri harsha is arguing that in daily life situation we are not concerned about the subjectivity of things we 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 just we are just okay with what we see like for example in the process of snake case when i see a snake in the rope the first cognition that i get is of a, a snake but 
due to the gradual co due to the con continuous cognition due to the uh, gradual cognition that i am going to uh, that that is going to take forth due to that gradual cognition in the first cognition if i see a snake in the row in the second cognition i might see something right and even if in the second cognition if i fail to see the row at least in the third cognition i would be able to see a row so here he is saying that in real life situation things are not so complex things are something else people rely on their perception and through that perception they rectify what they uh, what they perceive to be wrong so yeah uh so now the opponent has a major objection perhaps when it is said that the judge decided by these particular rules of debate this implies that one must accept that the perception of the judge become a real object of perception now the uh, interlocutor or now the nayika who is the opponent he is putting forth the statement that the judge who is the uh, who, who who has the owners to judge the whole setup of debate the debating between the interlocutors if the judge can see uh, a object as real he should trust the judge and the authority of the judge should be accepted now shri harsha again has problem with this and he says that this would again lead to regresses so how is it going to lead to regresses is that so shri harsha says but this should not be said because even if one were to accept the existence of the last perception uh, while one is thinking of the perception's existence perception's existence one would only be able to rely on a separate perception of its reality so this is to say that like the judge perception that is something let's say this is the first perception and now we are relying on the perception of the judge we would uh, we, we our perception the second perception and then uh, the case is that our perception that is relying on the perception of the judge is nothing but a mental thing which is a mental act and through this mental act you cannot just establish the what is accepted by the judge or what is uh, the existence of the pramana that the judge holds so again it it since it would lead to infinite regresses this is being rejected by shri harsha so now shri harsha uh, moves to another situation uh where he mentions that one only need to follow three or four more cognitions to determine whether the original cognition is trustworthy or not just as i mentioned that in this case of snow uh, snake and rope due to gradual cognition due to the constant cognition that i am taking of the situation i get to know that the situation the event that is happening in front of me is not the way i see not the cognition that i had before instead it is not the snake but the rope so yeah so now shri harsha also argues in that manner. uh now the opponent who argues back that uh let's suppose that the last cognition in the series is the is something non existent then all the other cognition in the series will be non existent as well so uh, this is to say that let's say that the fourth number of cognition is my last cognition and the last cognition turned out to be uh, something uh, something illusory like in the last cognition i got to know that what i cognized till the third cognition was something non existent then what are you going to do in that case so now shri harsha says that even if that is the case uh the regress uh, the regress and suit and all cognition were ultimately non existent even then people in world in, uh, in fact pressed content after three or four cognition so even if that is the case people would still rely on their perception or still rely on their cognition and this is how world works so this shows that how much he is emphasizing on the daily life situation and this is the reason why uh, i think for shri harsha debating is a matter uh, debating is a matter that can help us in our daily life situation so while nayika or the realist are arguing that debating is a process through which we establish the truth here uh, shri harsha is arguing that debating is a process through which we can 
help our daily life situation we can help our uh, help our uh, reality or the daily life uh, process to get some more knowledge about it so basically uh, i see uh, shri harsha arguing somewhat in the context of hume who would say that our daily life is governed by beliefs instead of knowledge so similarly here shri harsha is saying that no one in this uh, real life situation is so much concerned about the the complex process of epistemology the epistemic knowledge instead it is the belief that is governing us and we are living uh, living with the help of assumptions so yeah now the opponent since the last cognition theory is rejected by uh, shri harsha now the opponent might say that it is possible for a cognition to have existence in itself so just like i mentioned in the uh, in the third case where nagarjuna uh, where sorry where shri harsha uh, asked the uh, asked the nayaka opponent if it is the uh, cognition of thing that you are concerned about or if it is the sublation of if, if it is not the uh, possibility for the sublation of the uh, perception that you are worried about so here it seems clearly that nayakas are more concerned about the cognition than the real existence of existence of the object so here the opponent might say that it is possible for a cognition to have a existence in itself which would mean that the infinite regress does not arise and which provide a basis for everyday practice so now the opponent seems to establish uh, both the uh, both the real life situation or the real life practice at the same time denying the regress that was brought about brought about by shri harsha so shri harsha says that this view has a unwanted consequence that is still generates as infinite regress so now again shri harsha can see a infinite regress generating in this argument so he says uh, even the opponent's view everyday practice is really based on the self existent of cognition of an object but it is not based on the existence of object itself so as i mentioned that uh, nayaka is more concerned about the uh, cognition of the object than the object uh, existence of the object itself uh, in exactly the same way a non existent cognition which is equally unreal as the object is the basis of everyday practice sometime it can be the case that uh, we we assume things and our assumption would not be as real and as correct as the knowledge is but still we are living our life so object itself does not serve as the basis of everyday practice such as the debate and so the opponent has no reason to deny the non existent uh, things can be the basis of a debate so uh, from this we can like infer that shri harsha is mainly concerned about the everyday life and this is the reason why he says that debating as a process should be uh, something which should serve the everyday life or the serve, uh, serve the everyday purpose and this is sufficient you don't need to make so many rules in order to lead to a knowledge which we are even not certain if knowledge is possible or not and this is the reason why we call him a skeptic so he doesn't know about the existence of knowledge but he is sure that we live our life with beliefs and uh, beliefs can be uh, helped through the process of debating so he uh, so the first thing that i see in the uh, philosophizing of shri harsha he is widening the scope for the acceptance of pramana it is not only that through four pramanas which is accepted by nine aikas uh, you can every everything can be established truth can be established through that let's just uh, consider a characteristic Uh, as he mentioned the characteristic which would uh, recognize the fallacies in a debate process that is sufficient and through that you can debate and uh, holding a holding pramana is not so important according to shri harsha so yeah so now question can uh, arise if he is rejecting pramana then i would say no he doesn't seem to me to be rejecting pramana instead he is just uh, widening up the scope for the acceptance of pramana because if he would have rejected pramana then he would have never uh, accepted the contextual acceptance of pramana where like as i mentioned he says that uh, 
let the context decide what would be the qualifier for the uh, for the establishment of something or the establishment of truth and uh, not the predetermined qualifiers so yeah i would like to end my uh, thesis here so shri harsha has systematically undermined the opponent's view that the debate itself necessitates that both parties accept the existence of means of knowledge because it is possible for the debate to proceed without such an acceptance shri harsha is free to embark upon the various course of his buffet of destruction which is his, which is the name of his book khandana khanda khatya thank you thank you um, thank you tanushree for your presentation well uh, uh, it's a bit technical one well uh, we should have um, 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 gone for the second paper uh, immediately but i think because uh, avinash srivastava sir me uh, i don't think uh, if he sir you will be there till the end sir or should we uh, have your comments sir because if you are there till the end we can take the discussion towards the end srivastava sir no it was a good uh, presentation and i am not very much uh, well versed in the pramana shastra that's why i yes, <laughs> i am not in position to comment on it okay 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 anyway so so let us go with um, uh, please yes sir uh, <clears throat> thank you very much sir let me first congratulate these two uh, very intelligent students and uh, very young scholars for their nice deliberation ah uh, Tanushree Patel has presented herself in a very nice way, and she has tried to define ki how herself has tried to uh, recapitulate all these things in the pr pramana. Because ki she talks of jalpa vad and vitanda, but one thing I want to know from her, without accepting the pramana, how can debate proceed? Secondly, you talk of also vitanda. <coughs> what is the position of vitanda because vitanda has a, a simple uh, thing that he wants to one wants to win the debate and that's why he uses certain difficult things so that he, he may win so it is not the purpose of vitanda to know something to come to the right place and to get the knowledge of any particular thing right uh, rather of the vitanda is to win only so how can this be uh, compatible with the pramana because pramana is the karaka that is the means through which the prama can be acquired on the other hand this vitanda jalp and uh, jalp and vitanda their sole purpose is to win the debate only second thing and uh, kashmira murmu has did my spotlight very nicely on the epistemology as well as the metaphysics of jainism and she has said very very nicely that anant dharmakam vastu anant dharmakam eva tattvam so and it is difficult for everyone to know all these things because only kevali can understand and know the entire things and everyone is not a kevali and that's why the jain <coughs> jain epistemology has given a different turn and syatvad came into the uh, four line light because and that he says whenever you say anything you cannot you are not going to ex explain in a proper way that's why you can say syat perhaps it is syat asti syat nasti syat asti cha nasti cha so this saptabhangi ne came into the uh <clears throat> formation so it is a, it was a very very nice uh paper of both the uh, speakers both the scholars i congratulate you all you both for your nice presentation thank you very much thank you thank you professor srivastava sir well uh, and I, one one more thing i would like to know from kashmir as he say ki uh yeah jainism is a heterodox jainism cannot be said to be fully heterodox only because ki heterodox and orthodox have three criterion nastiko ved hinsaka or nindaka 
those who do not accept vedas they are nastika but for your information the rishabhadev the first tirthankar of jaina he was a upanishad kara also so how can we say that jainism is purely heterodox secondly heterodox system does not believe in next life transmigration on the other hand jainism believes in it so from one point of view jainism does not accept god and that's why it can it can be said to be a heterodox but since rishabhadev is very much here and rishabhadev is one of the upanishad scar and upanishad scar cannot be devoid of the vedas so that's why i to my mind i may be incorrect because uh, prof sir das is very much here to evaluate the things in a proper way so thank you both for your nice presentation thank you very much thank you thank you professor srivastava well before moving to pramod das sir well uh, and to tanushree well um, one thing uh, that i could see uh, here is he made a distinction between vata jalpa and uh, vitanda <laughs> what uh, professor srivastava sir was trying to say is that is um, rejecting uh, the counter perspective trying to establish the truth but here sriharsa is not doing that sriharsa is just going on rejecting the opponent without establishing his own position that is the position of a vitanda so sriharsa is not establishing anything he is just involved in rejecting the opponent and whatever um, uh, the thesis that is coming in he is just trying to reject it so and he is not establishing anything so in that perspective when we have raised the question also that um, uh, you see uh, uh, the basic understanding of the pramana is not there but still uh, how the debate will initiate with professor srivastava even um, um, pose this question so um, and 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 one uh, one more thing um, what is what are those characteristics of a fallacious argument that sriharsa proposes in order that uh, the debate will be initiated Okay, what are the conditions of a fallacious argument? So, how do you know that this argument is fallacious? Because here there is, you see, here in Vitanda, no rule follows because because Sriharsa is trying to reject, reject, reject. He is not in a position to accept whatever you say. He will try to reject, and he is not giving his own position also. So here, one more thing also comes. There is no rule at all because with whatever uh, rule he comes, Sriharsa will deny. so here the problem uh, rises in uh, i see a problem in the prasanga technique because in vitanda vada i don't think will be anyway arriving at the truth because because the with um, the vitandi vadins or the vitanda vadins they will uh, end up denying the opponent without saying anything from their own side so there lies a problem and um, I, I, i don't know a lot of things um, uh, have to be understood here because jalpa somehow Uh, in we want the victory we want our own position to um, uh, lead uh, with the vitanda also but here no position is getting established and how you do you justify sri harsha's position number one as professor srivastava even um, said number two what are the characteristics that we can find out for a fallacious argument and the third thing how do you know that uh, at a certain position um, 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 that there would be uh, whatever cognition that we have it will be Uh, not sublimated as you said by some other cognition so these are the three things um, uh, we would like to uh, would like to uh, learn from uh, what well, one thing is uh, vitanda has been defined as pratipaksh sthapana hinu vitanda mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so here one is not going to establish anything and jalpa is we vijigeshu katha jalpa because we want to win only <laughs> that is called jalpa and vitanda both are they are just simply countering the thing they are just rejecting the arguments their purpose is not to establish any position so jalpa and vitanda uh, they cannot be treated as a pramana and they are not following it they are destroying the basic characteristic of the pramana as well. vad paddhati vad paddhati sir Yes, Tanushri. Well, your your presentation, your technique, I really appreciate. Okay, very nicely. You are trying to come up. No, it, it was. It's a it's a great attempt. Then, anyway, please, we would like to learn from you. Actually, 
प्लीज हाँ ये स्थानों से uh he yeah, asked so as you were asking why do i call uh, shri harsha vaitandika so uh, as uh, even uh, sir mentioned that uh, the task of uh, vaitandika is to just deny so there is not even a question if the vaitandika wants a victory or not because even if he uh, comes with this intention that i want a victory that uh, that that putting forth the intention of the victory itself would become a position so and that would not make the the acceptance of that position would not make the person a vitandika anymore so i think the main characteristic of vitanda type of debate is just rejection so since shri harsha doesn't seem to me to establish a uh, any any thesis of its own and just trying to deny trying to negate anything that uh, the nayaika the opponent is saying so i call him a uh, vitanda vaitandika and uh, the second question uh, if i remember well was uh, sorry sir can you please repeat the second and third question so no truth is established only even even if somebody learns from sri harsha what would be his position also somehow and uh, in, uh, in the inter, uh, uh, the opponent is putting the same position which uh, your sri harsha has in mind then also sri harsha will deny that position because sri harsha has no position then because yeah. he, because even his own position will be denied because he doesn't want to establish anything suppose somebody learns from sri harsha what would be his stand on an issue and somehow that stand is put before sri harsha sri harsha is going to deny that position also so because he is a within the wajin yeah yeah so, so i want to share thing so like while i was reading i didn't uh, study much about his metaphysics so while he was discussing his metaphysics at first he uh, so he is basically called as the skeptic advaitin uh, so because uh, through the process of um, this this rejection he comes to a position where he uh, understand that there is not uh, non dual brahman and uh, this non dual brahman can be um, experienced through mystical experiences so i have not uh, gone through that i was only concerned about his debate and logics okay tanushri if that line is true if the last line is true then many things would be solved if um, as you said that uh, sri harsha is a uh, Uh, an advaitin and this technique of vitandavada that is uh, as you said uh, the prasanga technique that he is uh, adopting to reject uh, whatever thesis is coming before him in order to and and it somehow supports the technique of neti neti to reach at some mystical um, height okay is it is the thing that you are trying to say then then maybe um, I, i think um, uh, okay um, I, i i i think I, i could get something from you but uh, sri harsha in the context of pramana okay it becomes a bit of a problem for understanding because uh, there is no intention of establishing the truth number one number two whatever comes good or bad right or wrong there is simply a rejection but if this technique of rejection not not this not this not this not this if as you said towards the end if he is on the path of a uh, mystical path trying to deny everything that comes a physical okay material then i think some substance comes out of it because as you say towards that he is an advaitin maybe this technique he is trying to explore to reach at that uh, uh, that reality who is beyond um, the, the physical comprehension if that if that is the thing then i i could get a lot of things from uh, sri harsha my understanding i may be wrong okay as per your uh, understanding that i understood from what you say number one number two uh, the thing that i was trying to ask you is what sri harsha as you said the sri harsha says uh, as you said that there is a need to understand the characteristics of a fallacious argument and there is no need of understanding the pramana so this is another area which i want to learn from you what would be those characteristics of a fallacious argument that sri harsha supposes this is the second point that i uh, uh, wish to raise yes sir so since he is a vaitandika he would never agree what uh, he would never pre establish this uh, characteristic of uh, for the fallacious argument so he says everything depends on the context like what the uh, what is the debate that you are uh, debating for and uh, let the debate 
or the context decide the uh, pramanas or what uh, he would say the characteristic of fallacious argument okay thank you because that is vitanda everything is possible so he will yeah. take every plea to find fault with the opponent so that yeah, he sir. will find every <laughs> he will he will turn everything to find fault in the opponent and that's how he moves okay thank you thank you kashmir well professor uh, pramod yes yes please unmute. i want to just ha please uh, yes, sir. Sir, uh, a last thing i would like to clarify we should not think that uh, this sri harsha he intended to reach this metaphysical position due to which he becomes a advaitin instead it is the commentator who called him as advaitin and it is only through the process of epistemology he reached to that metaphysics okay thank you thank you okay it, it is the opponent who calls him as the advaitin the interlocutor yeah like it is the commentator who comments the on the commentator who calls him as uh, they call him okay thank you over to uh, professor das ha uh, thank you thank you dr rao mm actually i am not well versed about uh, sri harsha's philosophy what i enjoyed the last part of the discussion and i find the similarity between um bitandavada for sri harsha and uh, जैन एपिस्टेमोलॉजी दैट इज सैथ वैद दे आर वेरी मच सिमिलर इन बोथ द टेक्स्ट सर टिके वॉइस ना टिके बढ़ा दो सर प्लीज हेलो हां हां नाउ नाउ लाउडर हां ठीक है ओके फाइन फाइन सर ओके सो व्हेन श्री हर्ष इज रिजेक्टिंग द पॉसिबल कमेंट्स इंटरप्रिटेशंस about the reality uh this is the symptom of this is the sign of a uh, critical philosopher when we consider criticism in the true sense of the term this is the right spirit because Uh, every inter- interpretation has its limit every argument is perspective so we cannot establish the truth from any uh, perspective perspective and by any argument jaina system has also done that he has also rejected the possible views of all philosophers that knowledge is always relative um so it is natural because human mind is so limited and logic has also its own limit so we cannot uh, describe cannot define the truth as such therefore adaita vedanta uh, in adaita vedanta shankar has Uh, expl- uh, has tried to explain the world explain the reality uh, in the negative way nati 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 uh, so uh, according to um, uh, tanushri patel she is claiming that sri harsha is starting his philosophical inquiry from epistemology and that that, that is the right uh, approach of a philosopher to start from epistemology um so the presentation is very good i have some questions to um kashmira murmu she said um, that uh, we can have two souls somewhere she has said this we can have two souls or many souls uh, how is it possible number 1 number 2 uh aaj there is a question by smriti rekha that is also my question if every uh, interpretation is relative knowledge is relative by nature so there should not be any conclusion how can jain system make a conclusion because every conclusion is relative the the same question is asked here in the chat box so 
China system cannot conclude anything. That substance is like this, quality is like this. Because it because again it becomes a philosophy and he is rejecting all philosophy like Sri Harsha. And the second one and I, am, I forget the third question also. Uh, okay. uh -huh. uh, what is the status of a Kebala Gyani? That someone who knows everything, if, if uh, someone knows all the aspects of one thing, then he can know all the aspects of all things. Is it only a hypothetical statement? If then, if then, the form of if then, if so and, if so, and so, then so and so, uh, which has no meaning. In deductive logic also, we say if these are the premises, then this conclusion will follow. The premises may be false. From false propositions, we can um, derive a conclusion um, logically. So, is it only a hypothetical statement that who uh, knows all the aspects of one thing can know all the aspects of uh, all things? Because Jaina system rejects that one, one cannot know all the aspects of one thing. But again, it is said that the Kebal Gyani who knows all the aspects of one thing can know all the aspects of uh, all things. Is it merely hypothetical or is it really possible? Um, I never ask questions to um, questions here, but, but today I am excited to ask these three questions and I want to learn from Kashmira Murmu. Please have your response. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'll come to your question, but uh, uh, Srivastav sir also asked me something about um, like is it purely heterodox? So I would say that uh, what we have normally learned through our textbooks and all that it is normally basically taken to be a major heterodox school of, of Indian philosophy. But yes, uh, I got to learn a lot from him because this made oh uh, like this was like a food for thought like uh is it really a hetero purely heterodox like philosophy or not and that i'll thank sir for uh, suggesting another one is when we talk about two souls then it might seem very contradictory because there is nothing in this world where which is present where something is present of two souls so i would just say that this states that soul is not something this exemplifies or it implies that which has a certain form so practically if we try to interpret it then it would be very difficult for us to understand so here again this thing is stated that only a kevada gyani can know it now again what is the status of kevada gyani when some when it is stated that uh, Oh, by knowing all the aspects of one object, one can know all the aspects of the entire reality. It's, it's I don't think it is uh, like if, yes, it might be hypothetical in a sense, but what I understand from it is that the person who has the capacity to understand the all the aspects of at least one object has the capacity to understand all the aspects of the entire reality or he has that sort of uh, uh, potential to know it so it's somehow hypothetical but again it might be also be criticized as well i accept and lastly uh, again the third question that uh, jainism should not come to a conclusion because everything is relative in nature. I think, uh, yes, of course, this is quite uh, quite an important aspect of Jainism that it talks about relativity and at the same time it gives the 
and all, such certain sub, like substances and its features and all and this will this is something that will break the entire foundation of its own the theory it data it tries to make a theory and breaks its own theory but for me this is the conclusion when i talk about relativistic then i find that they talk about that this is that is relative but i find the conclusion that is drawn is by us the interpreters or the philosophers because we conclude that uh, uh, it is relativistic in nature because in the book it is written it is relativistic in nature i say that it is relativistic in nature but i don't know i don't know i don't say that i am completely sure but i don't know if it is somewhere written in the jaina text that it is relativistic in Uh, or uh, it talks about, uh, when it talks about dravya and all certain things need to be taken into account because without certain foundational things the entire thing will collapse so i understand that this is quite a difficult question to address because the theory it proposes again it breaks down its own theory so that is my submission that i think that we have inferred it in such a manner talking about uh, that if everything is relative then what i am saying is also relative my argument is relative my theory my conclusion everything is relative i think relative does not mean a wrong aspect or a dubious aspect rather it means a certain aspect one aspect Uh, because there might be number of aspects of a certain thing so relative does not mean this have we your response regarding the thing uh, there is another question in the chat box let me read it ma'am i have another doubt that if it is hypothetical then what would be your response regarding the tirthankara and also i have doubt that there is only kevala gyana state or not i think um first accepting the independent status of tirthankar or the kevala gyana it is again debated like how can you say that there is something like that which exists but uh, given because uh, jainism has a, one aspect of jainism is that it talks about liberation as a self effort and it talks about liberation as the knowl as having complete so if there would not be any sort of self effort or there would not be any sort of a uh, goal then there would be no use of attaining any sort of knowledge or any sort of effort or anything so as a as a reader of jain of philosophy as a student of jain of philosophy i would say that there are certain presuppositions that we need to accept before studying jainism because if we don't accept it then the entire theory will collapse but again this puts jainism in the contradictory forefront that if it philosophizes a certain theory then uh, it contradicts it and that's why i have all also say that it is like a or b but it talks that it is everything a, a b and all the aspects and that is where i also find the jainism that need to be addressed thank you thank you thank you